This video was sponsored by Brilliant.org. More on that later. It's been an astoundingly busy year for the Starship development program, with four test flights, the near completion of the orbital launch pad, and new revelations about Starship operations from Cape Canaveral. Hey everyone, this is Jack Byer with NASA Space Flight. While we saw four test flights of prototype Starship vehicles, we also watched on as SpaceX improved Starship's design, its manufacturing process, and the launch facilities required to test it. Although we're still waiting for the fabled first orbital test flight, we've seen SpaceX take huge strides towards that goal, and they look ready to hit the ground running in 2022. First off, let's revisit what was happening in Boca Chica one year ago from now, in December of 2020. Starship, serial number 8, the first full-scale Starship prototype, had just suffered a failure on landing due to low header tank pressure. Serial number 9, a similar but slightly improved vehicle, was installed on the suborbital pad B for testing after having tipped over in the high bay when a support holding it up gave way. What we didn't know is that the FAA had suspended all launch operations until the SN8 investigation was concluded, meaning SN9 wouldn't fly until February. Serial number 10, 11, and 12 were in various stages of assembly. However, serial number 12, 13, and 14 would never see flight, or even completed construction, due to SpaceX deciding to focus all resources on the improved serial number 15. Inside the high bay, which was still under construction, Super Heavy BN-1 was being assembled. This vehicle was simply a production pathfinder, meant to help SpaceX learn how to assemble Super Heavy boosters. Fun fact, booster number one featured a reverse tanking layout to current boosters with locks on the top and methane on the bottom. SpaceX was also beginning to ramp up Starship production. Parts for serial numbers 12 through 17 were seen around the site. At the launch site, the orbital launch pad was only six concrete forms, some cast concrete for future protective walls, and some electrical wiring. No evidence of the launch tower or the orbital tank farm was visible. The Boca Chica facility was in the midst of accelerating its pace and preparing for an onslaught of Starship flights over the next few months. So. Knowing our starting point, what happened this year to get us to where we are now? And what can we expect to see in 2022? Let's start off with the groundwork performed during the year. Now, initially it might not sound like the most exciting thing, but the ground support infrastructure is absolutely essential to making Starship fly, let alone building it. The most notable piece of groundwork performed throughout 2021 was the orbital launch site, or as Elon is known to call it, stage zero. As its name suggests, this site is designed to support testing and launch operations of completed Starship and Super Heavy vehicle stacks. More on that later. Like I said, not much existed of the orbital launch site at the end of 2020. Throughout this past year, we saw the launch tower, tank farm, and pad itself come together and perform their first tests. Let's start off with the tank farm. Due to the massive sizes and immense propellant needs of Starship and Super Heavy, SpaceX needed a significant amount of propellant storage. They built seven large tanks themselves, made up of the same barrel sections and domes used to build starships to hold the propellants for the site. These were installed on concrete pedestals near the roadway. The first tank was lifted into position in April, and the others followed over the coming months. In October, the final tank was lifted into place. In order to insulate these tanks from the harsh Texas sun, SpaceX also built shells to cover the tanks. These were 12 meters in diameter as opposed to the inner tanks 9 meters. They were lifted over the completed tanks, then the space between the two was filled with an insulating substance known as perlite. One extra shell was built and kept hollow for use as a water tank. Two large horizontal methane tanks were added in October to supplement these tanks. Why, you ask? Rumor has it that the Starship Heritage construction of the orbital tank farm's methane tanks is not up to code, and thus SpaceX is unable to use them to store CH4 without some kind of change or improvement. And so, these two large horizontal tanks will hold the methane used for testing until some other solution is implemented. The tank farm has been undergoing testing as components were installed. We saw the first deliveries of liquid nitrogen to it in September. It was finally used for the first time to load liquid nitrogen into B2.1, a test tank in November, 
before being used for Booster 4 cryo-proof testing in December. The launch tower quite literally rose from the ground this year. In the early parts of the year, crews assembled rebar for the foundation of the tower. Following the pouring of concrete, the first level of the tower was assembled on top of it and completed in April. The remaining tower sections were assembled at the propellant production site and only moved to the launch site and lifted into place once complete, thus speeding up the assembly process. The final section was added in July, and from there, crews spent the following months adding the cables, propellant lines, and other equipment necessary for the tower. Two notable additions to the tower were the quick disconnect arm and the chopsticks, also known as the catch arms. The quick disconnect arm, as its name implies, is a structure that will supply propellants and other necessities to Starship on the orbital pad before quickly retracting away at liftoff. It will also be used to stabilize the full Starship Super Heavy stack. It was installed in August. The chopsticks are two large movable arms that will catch Super Heavy boosters and ships eventually returning to land. Instead of putting heavy landing legs on the boosters or ships and impacting performance, SpaceX will attempt to catch them using these arms. The chopsticks will also be used to lift boosters and ships onto the orbital pad. The arms were fitted onto the tower in October and are still being worked on. The orbital pad was also assembled in sections. The six concrete pillars previously mentioned were topped off with vertical extensions in May to elevate vehicles higher off the ground. The launch mount, a round, extra heavy duty structure that boosters actually secure to, was assembled at the production site and was then moved to the launch site and lifted atop the six supports in July. Crews then spent the next few months outfitting the new structure with all the plumbing and cabling necessary to support vehicle testing and eventually flights. This included another quick disconnect that would service super heavy boosters. The tank farm, the tower, and launch pad are all necessary to support orbital flights. The complexity of these structures compared to the suborbital launch site really shows how much more difficult orbital launches will be. A lot of the heavy lifting at the orbital launch site was undertaken by a large crane nicknamed by SpaceXers Frankencrane due to its mismatched colors. Frankencrane was a Liebherr LR11350, one of the tallest crawler cranes in the world. Following completion of the launch tower, Frankencrane was lowered, disassembled, and shipped away for use on a different construction project. In October, SpaceX acquired their own crane, which is an LR11000, somewhat similar to Frankencrane, but a little bit smaller. This crane is in use at the launch site to perform miscellaneous heavy and high lifts, such as lifting Booster 4 onto the orbital pad. Moving on to the production site, work continued on the high bay and its rooftop bar. As of recording, the so-called high bar is still not finished, but now sports a balcony and nice glass windows. Work began in August on another high bay, except with a much larger footprint. Lovingly nicknamed the wide bay, this new structure will dramatically increase the available room to process and assemble super heavy boosters and starships. As of recording, the structure is two sections tall and rising rapidly. Nearby, the propellant production site was brought to life this past year. Formerly home to an old natural gas well, this plot of land was acquired by SpaceX and then transformed into a storage site and a liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen production facility. With the propellant production facility, SpaceX is making its own commodities from the atmosphere for use in vehicle testing. Also at this site, SpaceX assembled sections of the launch tower as well as the insulating shells for the new tank farm. In addition, the front side of this property sports a sign saying Starbase, the Boca Chica facility's name. At the main production site, we also said goodbye to four old prototypes, Starship Mark 1's nose cone, serial number five, serial number six, and the human landing system mock-up were all scrapped to make extra room for Starship assembly, as were large sections of serial number 17. The human landing system mock-up was a nose cone intended to feature a simulated interior of a lunar lander Starship. To conclude this year's groundwork, We've seen more walls and berms spring up as SpaceX matures the facility from a patch of barren land in South Texas to a fully fledged launch and production facility. As much as we love the views that we've gotten, the highly unusual nature of this situation should be noted, and no one should be surprised if sight lines and access continue to dwindle. Now that we've established the infrastructure needed to perform testing, let's actually dive into said testing. 
In March of 2021, SpaceX completed assembly of the first ever Super Heavy Booster, named Booster Number 1, or BN-1. While it was originally slated to perform ground testing, this vehicle ended up only being a production pathfinder. What this means is that it was only assembled to help SpaceX learn how to build boosters and improve upon the design and process flow for the next one. One fun fact, while booster number one was being assembled, the high bay was still under construction and didn't yet have a bridge crane installed inside it. So instead, SpaceX cut a hole in the roof of the high bay to have a mobile crane reach in and stack the vehicle. That was quite an interesting sight. Booster number one was scrapped in April of this year with its purpose complete. The next full scale booster would be booster three. This vehicle was originally intended to fly on the first orbital flight but that honor was later given to Booster 4, which had various improvements. Booster 3 was topped off in June before rolling to suborbital Pad A the following month. Pad A had previously been fitted with an adapter to allow boosters to be tested on it. On Pad A, Booster 3 performed a cryogenic proof test, where it was loaded with a small amount of liquid nitrogen before having three Raptor engines installed. Although Elon hinted on Twitter at the possibility of nine engines being installed on the vehicle, this would be the only engine test performed with Booster 3. SpaceX began scrapping Booster 3 in August, while it still sat on suborbital Pad A. Interestingly, scrapping stopped after the methane tank was disassembled, and the bottom two-thirds of Booster 3, essentially the LOX tank, remains on Pad A to this day. It is unknown exactly why, but this is likely just because SpaceX has dedicated all resources elsewhere, with Pad A not currently needed to support testing. You may have noticed we skipped Booster 2. For an unknown reason, parts of Booster 2 were assembled into two test tanks and given confusing names, BN 2.1 and B 2.1, due to SpaceX switching nomenclature in the Starship program from serial number SN and booster number BN to just ship and booster, respectively. The BN 2.1 test tank was built from the aft and forward domes of Booster 2. This small tank was used, like so many are, for structural validation and testing, to ensure Super Heavy's center engine mounts could withstand the force of nine engines firing into them. Testing on the tank was performed in June before it was rolled back to the production site. B2.1 was built from a ship aft dome and a booster forward dome, but features the outer 20 attachment points for booster engines. As of recording, B2.1 is fitted with a jig on top that will be used to compress the tank, simulating the loads that a real booster will endure in flight. SpaceX built a Starship test tank called Serial Number 7.2 to trial thinner steel for use in Starship's tank walls. This vehicle used 3mm steel rather than the 4mm steel currently used on Starship and Super Heavy. Several tests were performed on the tank, and in February, it sprung a leak during a test to failure. It was later scrapped. So far, 3mm steel has not yet been used in production starships. However, the nose cone barrel section for Ship 22 was made from 3.6mm steel. Recently, that barrel has been spotted inside the windbreak and appears to have been repurposed as a second cargo door pathfinder. Finally, the Orbital Tank Farm's fourth tank, known as GSE-4, was repurposed as a test tank to verify the design of the GSE tanks at the orbital launch site. This stubby tank underwent cryogenic testing in August before moving back to the production site. Strangely, it returned to the launch site in November for unknown reasons. In March and April of this year, SpaceX assembled a nose cone testing rig. Since Starship SN-12 was canceled, they installed its nose cone inside the device. The rig and cone were moved to the launch site where forces were exerted on the nose cone and flap connectors to simulate aerodynamic loads. Following testing, the nose cone was, you guessed it, scrapped. Speaking of nose cones, what would have become Ship 17's nose cone was used as the first Starship cargo bay pathfinder. It was scrapped soon afterward. Elon said on Twitter that the true cargo door design was still under development. Now, let's move to the flight-worthy Starships themselves. Starship SN9 did something unique during its test campaign, well, aside from falling over in the high bay. It initially performed its usual cryo-proof and static fire testing. However, after this, SpaceX performed three additional static fires with the vehicle, in quick succession, in fact, within the same day. This sort of thing has not been replicated since. 
Serial number 9 then performed a 10 kilometer test flight on February 2nd. Liftoff, engine shutdown, and the belly flop maneuver all appeared to go according to plan. However, one of the Raptor engines failed to ignite for landing, causing the vehicle to lose control and crash into the landing pad. Starship serial number 10 was not far behind, and it was actually on pad A while serial number 9 was launching from pad B, something that, again, has not been repeated. Serial number 10 would follow in serial number 9's footsteps by performing its own 10km flight on March 3rd. SN10 was similar to SN9, except it featured many more heat shield tiles on it in order to test how they would stay attached during flight. SN10 would attempt to improve on SN9's flight profile by reigniting all three Raptor engines instead of just two prior to landing, then quickly down-selecting the best two to use, shutting down the third, before then switching to one for the final touchdown. During its flight, serial number 10 also had a nominal ascent and descent. Right before landing, all three Raptor engines ignited successfully, the vehicle down-selected to the best two, and the vehicle flipped vertical, then landed on the landing pad using one Raptor engine. After SN10 landed, everything seemed fine, save for a small residual fire caused by a methane leak. But about 10 minutes after landing, SN10 exploded and the vehicle was destroyed. It was later determined that some helium bubbles from the tanks got into a Raptor engine, lowering its thrust and making the vehicle land with a higher velocity than expected. Because of this hard landing on the pad, a leak in a methane line formed, which ultimately led to the vehicle's destruction. Seal number 11 flew a similar mission less than a month later, on March 30th, though basically nobody saw it thanks to a thick blanket of fog. It aimed to build on SN10's flight profile by landing with two Raptor engines instead of one. Following a successful ascent and belly flop, serial number 11 exploded above the ground right at engine reignition. Unfortunately, because it was a foggy day, what was surely a spectacular explosion was not visible, though debris was seen falling on the ground around the launch site. Elon confirmed later that a small methane fire had damaged the avionics, leading to a hard start and an explosion on Raptor engine reignition. Because serial numbers 12 through 14 had been canceled, serial number 15 would be the next to fly. This had several upgrades over serial number 11, including upgraded engines, improved internal plumbing, and a much larger array of test heat shield tiles. SN15 took flight on May 5th, quickly disappearing into the clouds above the launch site. It too had a nominal ascent and belly flop, but upon engine reignition, only two of three Raptor engines lit. But this was enough, and the vehicle made its way to the landing pad and softly touched down. It depressurized its tanks and, a week later, was moved onto pad B for minor post-flight testing. On May 26th, SN15 was rolled back to the production site. Around this time, the naming change took place, and SN16 became Ship 16. Ship 16 was fully assembled inside the high bay while SN15 took flight. Elon hinted that Ship 16 might be used for a hypersonic test flight but those plans were shelved as SpaceX put all resources into getting to orbit. SN15 and Ship 16 were both moved to a display location near the production site, where they are to this day. Speaking of orbit, let's discuss Booster 4 and Ship 20. Ship 20 features several upgrades over SN15. It features three Raptor engines and a full heat shield. In addition, it has the attachment points needed to connect to a super heavy booster. As of recording, Ship 20 and Booster 4 are still slotted to fly on the first orbital test flight. With these two vehicles, we saw one of the most significant sights of the year. On August 6th, crews installed Booster 4 onto the still under construction orbital launch mount, before stacking Ship 20 on top. This is the first time a vehicle was installed on the orbital pad, and also the first full Starship stack. This event, though it was mostly a photo op, was also used to ensure that the ship and booster could probably connect and the necessary precision to stack ship on top of booster existed. Only an hour or two later, and after a little bit of music, Ship 20 was destacked. Both vehicles returned to the production site for continued work to prepare for their testing. They later rolled back to the launch site where engines were installed and final work was performed. Since then, Ship 20 has performed several static fire tests, culminating in a firing of all six of its Raptor engines.
a first for any Starship and the current record for most Raptor engines fired at once. Ship 20 now resides on suborbital pad B, while final work and testing on it is performed. Booster 4, meanwhile, has had aerodynamic covers attached and several engines swapped. It was lifted back onto the now nearly complete orbital pad for a third time in December, where it performed cryogenic proofing. The launch date of the first orbital flight is still unclear, though it could happen as early as the first part of 2022. We went from not having an orbital launch site to one having been built. We saw what the first ship with full TPS tiling looks like, we saw the first successful landing of a Starship with SN15, and we saw the first ever Starship Super Heavy full stack. What can we expect to see in 2022? But first, I'd like to try something new and thank this video's sponsor, Brilliant.org. If you're like me, you learn best from hands-on experience. With Brilliant, you get fun, interactive lessons in math, science, and computer science that help you learn more effectively than just watching a video. I've been taking the scientific thinking course to help keep my brain sharp, and I really like how the simulations provided let you manipulate variables and learn by doing, rather than just reading or watching something. From the basics of how light works, all the way to quantum light and even relativity, it covers all sorts of fascinating topics that I think viewers of this channel will really enjoy. Join the millions of people already learning on Brilliant with a special offer just for our viewers. Head to brilliant.org slash NASA Spaceflight to get started for free with Brilliant's interactive lessons. The first 200 people to sign up will also get 20% off an annual membership. With Brilliant, anyone can understand STEM concepts. As we mentioned, the orbital test flight is set to occur sometime in early 2022. Because this is all a test campaign, and SpaceX has loads of test objectives to meet and lots of data to gather, Additional vehicles are being readied for follow-on flights. The timeline of the orbital flight also hinges on the progress of the environmental assessment currently being performed by the FAA. A draft of the assessment was released in September, and we'll touch on some of those details in just a second. Booster 5 was fully assembled and then placed into storage with an unknown future. Booster 6 parts have become a test tank, so we'll have to see what vehicle flies on the second orbital mission. Booster 7 is under construction in the high bay as of this recording, and is believed to be the first booster to support a full complement of 33 Raptor engines, as well as the first booster to support the use of the Raptor 2 variant. We saw the first 13 engine thrust pucks to support a 33 engine booster delivered this year, and that alone was a big milestone in a year filled with big milestones. Meanwhile, Ship 21 is in the final stages of assembly, and Ship 22 is in the midst of stacking. Parts for vehicles all the way up to Ship 24 have been spotted. Another thing to watch out for in 2022 is the first spotting of a Raptor 2, which currently has not yet been seen up close or in Boca Chica at all. Raptor 2, a new and very much improved version of Raptor, began testing in production this year. Raptor 2 will produce approximately 230 tons of force compared to the 185 tons from Raptor 1. It will also be much cheaper and easier to produce. Raptor 2 will be used on all future ships and boosters. At SpaceX's McGregor Engine Testing Facility, a dedicated Raptor 2 factory has been built and is coming online. SpaceX has applied to the FAA seeking permission to fly up to three orbital flights per year in the development phase and five in the operational phase. We'll have to see how long it'll be until they inquire about a higher flight rate. Their application also seeks permission to eventually land up to five boosters and 10 ships back at Boca Chica. While the timeline for orbital vehicle recovery is unclear, hopefully some attempts will be made in 2022. However, we do know that SpaceX plans to attempt a soft water landing of Booster 4 on the orbital flight, though both Ship 20 and Booster 4 will be expended. In terms of groundwork, the draft environmental assessment includes plans for a second orbital launch pad, a second landing pad, a second orbital tank farm, and much more, including a payload processing facility that could dwarf even the new wide bay. We should see work on these begin, depending on how the environmental assessment and orbital flights go in 2022. Finally, in December, Elon confirmed that work has resumed on Starship infrastructure at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Previously, work had started on a Starship launch mount at Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, but that was stopped to prioritize work at Boca Chica. Now, it seems that Florida Starship is once again in work, so that will be another interesting thing to watch out for in 2022. Elon even mentioned that it could be ready by this summer, 
but we'll just have to wait and see if that's another case of Elon time. It seems Florida will be home to multiple Starship launch facilities, both at LC-39A and LC-49. Starships in Florida will likely be assembled, at least partly, at SpaceX's Roberts Road site, which currently supports Falcon Booster refurbishment. We've seen, via Harry Stranger's satellite photos, that ground is currently being cleared at the site. So, that's a look back on 2021 in the world of Starship. It's been a big year, with lots of rapid progress, and 2022 will likely be the same, if not better. It's been so much to follow this program so far, and we thank all of our viewers and channel members for supporting our Starship content and everything we do throughout 2021. If you'd like to support our content, please consider becoming a channel member. It really helps us do what we do. We have several cool perks for our members, including member-exclusive chat emoji, preview videos that go live before the daily videos do, and Discord access. We appreciate all the support from everyone that watches our channel and especially from our members this year. We hope you enjoyed this video and have a happy, safe, and healthy new year.